Another week, another Watch News Weekly episode. I'm joined by Marco to my right. Uh, we're here to discuss quite a few exciting topics, so let's jump right in without wasting time. The first topic on the screen is going to be <laughs> uh, Rolex is Omega's new landlord. I mean, this is all over social media already, but in a nutshell, uh, sub a Rolex subsidiary, it wasn't actually Rolex, they purchased a building in Geneva that houses the flagship boutique of Omega. Now, it's not very clear how much rent Omega is going to pay, uh, you know, to its biggest competitor every month, but they say it's a pretty sizable amount. Uh, and Rolex will actually have a say on how the building is maintained and ran. It could even terminate an existing lease. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about Rolex is, so Rolex is part of the Hans Wilsdorf Foundation, right? right? And the actual foundation, if I'm not mistaken, they're actually the owner of the most property in all of Switzerland. Like, they own the most land in all of Switzerland. So they buy up land and rent it out, and that's part of the actual foundation that's then used to, you know, for charitable, charitable works. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting in that Omega now is owned by Rolex in terms of like physical property and not to mention Booker, which was one of their biggest points of sale of Omega is now also owned by Rolex. So they benefit. I don't from know how true Omega. or not. I don't know how true or not, Omega but, uh, I saw somewhere when the news broke that, uh, uh, Booker was bought by Rolex that in their flagship store uh, in Geneva, they took down the Omega sign. It's, it's totally possible. I mean, it's their, their brand now. So they, I guess they can kind of do whatever they want at this point. It's like me going and buying watch boxes building, like, you know what I mean? In, <laughs> yeah, in, in Ballard Kingwood, you know what I mean? Which by, which, by the way, we actually have very, very similar buildings. Like we yeah. have literally about the same square footage. They're literally completely square. The setup on the outside of the parking lot, it's literally like the same. It's so weird, except theirs is a little bit darker and ours is light blue. But yeah, this is a, I would love to see a follow up on this in a couple of weeks just to see what's going to transpire from this. Of course, a lot of this is people speculating and saying all this could potentially be is yet, like you said, the foundation making yeah, yet another probably, real estate yeah, investment, which they've done over the last year, uh, how many years? I don't even remember. Uh, let's move to the next topic, and that is Mohammed Zaman's collection and auction. Mohammed Zaman is one of the biggest collectors in the world. Uh, this guy has purchased probably some of the most important watches that have ever existed. Uh, a lot of them were record setting because uh, he does like to buy through auctions and uh, very publicly, if you will, right? And I always bring that, I, the reason I said that is because, you know, there's still that flex factor in auction, right? To show, you know, sit in the room and show somebody how big your dick is versus the other guy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is why some of these prices tend to get outrageous. And I sometimes tell people like, you know, yeah, I know that watch fest 100 in auction, but it's worth 50. Like, what do you mean? Like, well, because you have two guys that have more money than God. Not to get sidetracked, but an interesting thing, I have a friend who, who's actually a Swiss resident, and he says, like, a lot of these auctions specifically for Rolex uh, will get so high in price because essentially when Rolex is in the room, nobody really bids because they know that they're going to get outbid. But what will happen is it's a bidding war between an online buyer and somebody who's at the actual auction that represented, that's representing Rolex, and they have more money than God seemingly. So like they can just yeah, it's bid in their as much it's in as their they favor. want. It's yeah, in their exactly. favor to bid those watches. Now, I know that Zaman's collection includes some of the most important watches. Uh, and one of the things I'll mention that some of the watches he owns actually came from us. I guess we should highlight some of the watches, spend a little bit more uh, time on this topic, starting with the Marlon Brando Rolex, the GMT Master 1675. And this is where I get iffy because you're tying a name to an object. Is this watch, why is this watch worth that much more? Because a regular 1675 GMT Master would not fetch anywhere near what this is estimated. Yeah, this is the most expensive GMT Master uh, 2 or GMT Master ever sold at auction, right? So I think at the time it fetched uh, over a million dollars. And I assume in this case, probably it will fetch, uh, if, I, if I was a betting man, probably significantly less than that, right? I, yeah. I don't... Because I don't think, um, I, I think that was like a time where it was kind of perfect for the vintage watch market. Not to mention that there's a lot of vintage watches in this actual auction. Uh, from Rolex specifically, I mean, things like uh, even their triple calendar, uh, a bunch of Tiffany sign uh, Rolexes, Patek Philippe's. So I don't know how this will perform, but it'll be interesting because again, it's, it's listen, there's nothing special about it other than the fact that it was owned by an actor, right? It's a bezel. I mean, it's a hell of an actor. It, yeah, fair enough. And he wore it the in the movie. The Godfather's right? watch. I mean, and, and he also wore it in the movie. Fair, like, fair enough. But I, I, I don't is know. Is this a watch that Rolex may want to put in their museum? It's a good point. It's, it's like a, It's like an yeah. Omega worn by Sean Connery or yeah. Rolex worn, yeah. worn by Sean Connery in one of the movies. That's a watch that belongs in their museum. Possibly. So in that case, they need somebody who really, really wants this watch. This reminds me of a story, a friend of ours who was in the industry, uh, he's been in the industry longer than I have, 
once bought a piano that belonged to Elvis Presley. He paid 900000 for it. You know what I asked him? I said, well, what's it worth? Like, he's like, it's, it's, and why? He's like, oh, this is just a pride of ownership. Thing. Yeah, it's I wanted really it and I was willing yeah. to pay that. Well, another watch that goes, is going up on a chopping I mean, block, this is right up your alley. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, this is, this is like the godfather of, again, the godfather of independent watchmaking, I would say, is George Daniels, very much so because he es essentially ushered in the new generation from the likes of F.P. Jordan and Roger Smith. And this is actually the anniversary. So the George Daniels anniversary was actually pitched by Roger Smith. Uh, it was actually made for the most part by Roger Smith and his atelier. Uh, this is actually number zero zero, and it's in platinum. Only one of four ever known. Uh, so this is going to be this is going to be an interesting one because actually the last George Daniels I think actually pretty uh, like it underperformed at auction. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how this one does, considering it's arguably you know one of the most important wristwatches uh, he made because again number zero zero being the the first one ever made. In the prototype, uh, technically. yeah, exactly, and it's in platinum. So. Well. I, I will say only one thing, uh, nine out of 10 times, when you look at limited edition pieces, right? Uh, I've always told clients, it doesn't matter if you have the number one piece or the one 100 piece, right? Yeah. It's, a, it's a matter of press, oh, I have the number, it's, a, it's sort of a flex, right? But on a secondary for guys like us, if it's a limited run of 100 pieces or 50 pieces or 10 pieces, to me, number one is worth just the same as, let's say, number two, three, or four, or five, yeah. right? But I think this is definitely an exception. Being a model zero, zero usually signifies right. prototype. and. It's, it's like, important for historically important watches, right? Like if you're getting a very low serial, a serial Royal Oak, right? right. The 5402, for example, that then sure. The, uh, one, you know. the one I had to sell off my wrist was uh, uh, it was under it was it was number 82, I think. Right. So so that 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 will you know that's again pride of ownership, right? Because it's one of the first ones ever made, and in this case, it, it would be likewise the same thing, right? There's other there's other George Daniels anniversary uh, that have popped up in yellow, gold, and platinum before, but you know being number. Let's two. go to the next slide, and he, we're talking about. We saw a rise of older Royal Oaks, especially older Royal Oak Perpetuals, be, be their skeletons, be their fancy dolls, et cetera, et cetera. Ten years ago, you could pick these watches up for 20 grand, right? Yeah. And this is the Quantine Perpetual. This is a 25686PR, which is a two-tone, but it's the special dial. It's a Tuscan dial here, which is a little unusual in a two-tone case. So in, in, in a two-tone case in this reference, if I'm not mistaken, they made a total of 300 in this reference and 25 in two-tone. Right, but usually when you see a Tuscan dial, you'll see it in steel and platinum. So have, seeing it in a two-tone uh, with with rose gold is is a little unusual. I really like it, and I really wanted to bring this to people's attention because I feel like vintage Royal Oak, specifically 39 millimeter perpetuals, are so undervalued in the market today. Well, well, hold and, on a second. They went up like crazy. Remember, yes. the, remember the two-tone tantalum that we had at yeah, 700 in auction. Okay, but, but today that watch is worth half that. True, but at the same time, we're at a point in the market where these are just a value buy. Because, okay, consider, for example, a watch like this versus a ceramic perpetual calendar, right? A ceramic perpetual today is probably, now that it's discontinued, 220, 230, let's say. So you're going to pay 220,000 for a somewhat mass produced, obviously still somewhat rare, versus this, of which we only know 25 to exist. And it's in that original 39 millimeter case size. To me, this is much more special because it's. First of all, it represents a handmade watch, right? This is not a serious, this is when uh, AP The finishing still, in the back is insane. Correct, don't it's see still the very much a handmade watch by AP. And not to mention, again, it's, it's something that's so much rarer than current production AP Royal Oak. I think the only, thing, the only thing that this thing has going against it is A, the current market and the sour, the sour feeling that people have left in their mouth in regards to when your skeleton perpetual 39 millimeter and platinum fetched four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. When your yellow gold perpetual skeletons went all the way up to three hundred thousand and now trading at a lot less, at least a hundred thousand dollars less. This may be the victim of that, but last but not least, this may be the victim of somebody who may just look at this watch, oh my god, so that's fing ugly. Yeah. Right? It's attractive to me, but I'm uber biased. I understand the rarity. Its rarity is attractive to me. The dial is attractive to me. The whole combination is attractive. The way it's put together is attractive to me, but it's also my favorite brand. But some people may just say, you know what? I don't think it's a pretty watch. Yeah, maybe just not this one, but again, there's a ton of them in this auction that we spoke about, right? The Yellow Gold Perpetual, Platinum Perpetual, both skeletonized. Uh, they're actually coming up at this well, auction. Well, I too, am so really, really rooting for this auction, specifically these pieces, along with the ones we're gonna discuss next, because I would love to see this market go back up, because as I said, there's still, there was, I felt like there was value in these pieces even at the highest point of the market. I yeah. feel like, especially the ones that were really, really real production, yeah. tantalum rose gold, tantalum rose gold skeleton, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and the pieces like this. And the next slide we have, 
conjurers, right? Well, we actually, let's start with the Philippe IV Grand and Petit Saint Henri Mini Repeater. Again, Philippe IV, again, piece number one, yeah. uber complicated watch. Arguably, would you say Philippe IV is top five Mini Repeater makers out there? Yeah, so uh, for those who don't know the backstory, Philippe IV used to make Mini Repeaters for AP before right. he started right. uh, his own brand, right? And this was kind of the watch that launched his brand, if you will, right? He made four of these uh, that are known to exist. And I think this one was sold if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, down in the comments by a collected man and it set a record uh, for like the most expensive Philip Dufour ever sold. And one year later, it's coming up at auction. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if it fetches. I think this sold for like four plus million dollars uh, at the time. But yeah, it, he he's well well regarded as maybe the greatest fin like movement finisher of all time. Also uh, great, one of the greatest mini repeater makers. Yeah, or one of the greatest watchmakers, period, right? What he did with the duality is, is exceptional, especially at the time that he did it. Nobody had miniaturized it in, in a wristwatch, but it'll be interesting to see how this performs because again, I don't know how the Dupe 4 market will fare because it's still very, very strong, but we haven't seen something like this come up. This is like- Ever. It's, <laughs> like, it's like saying like, you know, Mercedes is still selling well, but how well would the new MG1 do, right, or something like that? Yeah, it's just uh, we haven't seen it come up now, ever. Now, it's, uh, timing is okay. The market has stabilized. People are starting to forget about the correction that took place a little over a year ago. So I think the timing is okay. If you have to rank in order, J George Daniels, uh, Roger Smith, Philippe Dufour, where would Philippe Dufour fall? Uh, I would say probably uh, George Daniels is one for well, sure. Well, yes. But, yeah, by far. And then Dufour is two, and then Roger, Roger would okay, be Okay, that's, that's kind of how I feel. Now, moving yeah. on to the next one, is to protect Philippe Nautilus, the reference number 3700. The ones that are near and dear to our heart is the ones with the Conjar logos. I'm actually wearing a 3700, but not the Conjar. Just a yellow. No conjure. Yeah. No. If you got a pencil, I could probably draw one <laughs> real quick. But uh, here's what I will tell you. What we have we have personally sold two 3700 with conjures. I won't disclose the numbers. I'll be curious to see what this auction fetches. And the reason for that is because people really do see value in these things. Lots of rumors in regards to how many are made. Supposedly six in yellow gold. Some say five. I know of four serial numbers because I sold two out of the fours, right? And this information comes from a friend at Christie's because they've sold one as well. Uh, I've yet to have one in stainless steel. We had the rarest one of them all, which was the 3700 in white gold, of which they made three. Uh, we sold that one a, a couple of years back now. Uh, that one fetched two million. Uh, I, would, I would like to see nothing short of a million plus on the yellow. Yeah. Uh, and on a, the steel may surprise you. The condition of the dial is not the greatest, yeah, it's but true. people will look at that as a, a dial that's going tropical on you. And in regards to how many of those are made, again, rumor has it there's only 12 in stainless steel. And for those of you guys that don't know, these were made for the Sultan of Oman, the one that passed away, may he rest in peace. And he uh, ordered, custom ordered these, and these were not watches that were randomly given out as gifts. These were in his personal collection, that's why there were so few of them. And I am really, this is probably the two watches I'm looking to most forward to see how much they actually fetch. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see because again, this is something that probably won't turn up at auction again, I would say for another five years, but three to five years. These don't tend to turn up. A lot of them sold privately. Yeah. The two that we sold, we sold privately. Okay. And we choose to sell them privately because for many reasons, not a lot of people want to spend seven figures publicly either. Right. You know what I mean? Let's go to the next slide. And the next slide is the next piece of news that we have to bring you from, yes, Ming. That's right, Ming watches. There's a new lightest watch in town. At head only, and this is how they measure these watches, head only, 8.8 .8 grams. Manually wound version and 10.8 grams for the automatic. Now, Ming says they believe they are the world's lightest mechanical watches. Now, traditional Ming case shape and lugs, a printed crystal with the hashes, indicated five minute intervals, and a dark sapphire dial. Now, there is no dial on this watch to say, wait, Ming removed the dial and done a gradient print on the surface of the crystal to hide the movement, which is actually a pretty neat trick. Question for you Thinnest watch ever, would you consider that a feat? Um, yes, because again, miniaturizing you know, the mechanics of a watch is extremely difficult, right? But in terms of lightness, I don't know. I don't know if that's... Well, now that I'm looking at it, look, it has to have basic components that you sure. can't get away from. Yes. You have to have your, your plates, your, your wheels, all that stuff has to be there. So in my mind, I think that's a flex. How do you make a watch 
Uber light. Yeah, I mean, FP Jordan did, you know, aluminum watch, aluminum movement, Richard Mill, obviously. Uh, it's nowhere near 8.8 grams. Right, right, Richard. 10.8 grams for an automatic. Yeah, that's. That means that thing has a rotor. It's it's very light, very, very, it's, it's, it's Just impressive. The, like no how much, how much, I would love to see a breakdown on this watch as to how much each part weighs. Like, how much does the rotor weigh in this thing? Right, right, right. I'm assuming it's a micro rotor, not a, not a full size rotor, but still, crown. Just think about all these things. The stem of the crown is at least a gram. Yeah. So I, they don't really give you much detail in regards to materials used on the inside. I would love to have, to dive into this a little bit deeper I and get some more information. I just don't know how I feel about this whole like light watch, thin watch. Like I feel like a, a watch has to feel substantial on your wrist in order to feel somewhat luxurious. You know what I mean? Like there is that reassuring heft you get from Rolex, AP, Patek, Richard Mill, even light Richard Mills but this is all, still this, feel like, you know what I mean? They're but still this is like still that. in line, this is still in line with sort of flexing on use of materials like crystal or TPT or TPT as I they, th Richard I think Mill this for it. Ming specifically is more of a marketing campaign, like look what we did, look what we accomplished as a kind of young upset, because they've only been around, for, they've been around less than a decade, right? Yeah, no. and, and they've they've made some, they made some good, themselves. yeah, they made some good buzz for themselves and I think this is definitely one way for them to do it. I mean, we're talking about it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm sure we're not the only ones that are going to talk about this watch. So therefore, it, it's, they succeeded. Interesting. Next slide is Erwerk Summer Watch. Now, Erwerk 100V Time & Culture 2 Summer Watch. Uh, for its newest release, the company travels back to Mesopotamia to give us the Erwerk UR100 Time & Culture 2 Summer Watch inspired by the city of Ur. Measures 41 millimeters, 49 millimeters in length, 14 millimeters six, rendered in a rich blue hue. 30 of these made it and priced at 72,000 Swiss francs. The name Erwerk actually derives from the city of Ur, that used yeah, ancient yeah. city in Mesopotamia, so there's a play on that. You have the calendars, you have all the markings uh, from the era, and this is, I don't know why they come up with summer. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. That's an interesting theory, right? I, I know that they did these kind of engraved cases before. Right? Yes, they, this is the came, first one. Right, they, they came out with one last year, um, and it'll be interesting to see uh, how this plays out, because these are very, very popular models for Erwerk, and I don't know, it's a very cool looking watch, super interesting. So one of the things I will tell you from experience is anytime I got my hands on engraved Erwerks, they, they immediately sold. There's yeah. a cult following for the brand, and when you get into something uh, that's uh, the one I had that was engraved was less than 30 pieces production. And I think what they're doing is they're, they're catering this to their Herbert customers, to their existing client base. And that's a good thing because they're giving them, again, a popular model as it is. It's priced reasonable in comparison to some of the other pieces. And it's a fun, and like you said, good looking watch, definitely a conversation starter, definitely a yeah. head turner. Definitely, definitely cool and unique and out of the box. And that's what we've come to expect from the brand. Let's go to the next piece of news. And the next piece of news is Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean Dark Gray. I know you're shaking your head. So Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean Dark Gray Titanium GMT. Crafting the case, the bezel, the dial, and the class, and even the movement from titanium, which obviously is going to make the watch very, very lightweight. They don't mention the weight in here. Uh, now it's 45 millimeters, very normal size uh, for Planet Ocean. Uh, it's a 51 and a half millimeter lug to lug distance. Priced at twenty-two thousand, which is eight thousand dollars more than the Yacht Master RLX Titanium. I love how the companies will just say, "Oh, it's the, ours is like who was it? Uh, Everose Daytona, Everose yeah, yeah. Gold, Honey Gold from Longa. Yeah, this is RLX Rolls Titanium. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, if anything, get it's a just little, a proprietary. Blend. I get it's, it, it's but like, like get a little bit more creative than RLX. Might yeah. as well just call it Rolex Titanium, right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, look, I guess the impressive side of it is going to be the fact that everything is made out of titanium. I can't think of a watch that's entirely made out of titanium to include the movement. Uh, I mean, I, I guess, but that's just, like, I just don't understand who thinks these are good releases from Omega. I mean, it's 45 and a half millimeters, behemoth of a watch at 17 millimeters thick. Like, I, I just, I don't get it. It's, it's such a disproportionate, large watch because you get a huge, like, head of a watch, and then it's only 51 millimeters lug to lug. It just, disproportionate, too thick, and like I, I just I don't I don't like it. You know what I mean? It it just it doesn't make sense I, as a release. Aesthetically, I do like it. But I like it aesthetically. I like the I like the whole gray theme. It goes well with the fact that it's yeah, the, the aesthetics of it, the movement is really nice. But again, the, the proportions are way off, and the price is at twenty two thousand. It's a joke. You know what I mean? Like I'm sorry to say, there's there Monta makes a thousand dollar GMT. Uh, in titanium, maybe it doesn't have a titanium movement, but like it, it's like a few thousand dollars, and 
it's just as good just as good as this seemingly because you pay a fraction of the price. Rolex makes a GMT Master II at a fraction of the price. And okay, well, hold even, on. Let's take that with a grain of salt. So the, hold so, on one second. So. Even for example, Omega has made these pla Planet Oceans before, these Planet Ocean GFTs. Granted, this is a new movement. For a fraction of the price, you could pick those up. It was up. under 10000 Yeah, you could pick those up four or 5000 today. I will finish it with this. Take the comparison to the Rolex with a grain of salt that retails for $14,000. And the reason I say this is because that watch is currently, I've seen maybe one or two. It's a new release. I've seen one or two on the market and people asking forty five grand for them. Yeah, and it also comes with a bracelet. Yeah. This doesn't. <laughs> That's okay. it. Uh, and for our last topic, we're st we can't keep Omega out of this uh, episode because uh, we talked about the Omega be building being bought. We talked about the new Omega release. Now let's talk about the fact that there's a show between 9th and 19th in New York City uh, that basically features Omega's story. And I will say this, when it comes to history, when it comes to uh, not to get into an entire episode of Omega's history, I think I did that at one point on uh, What's on My Desk, but when it comes to Omega's history, it is uber rich. The Omega's history is very, very rich and it rivals pretty much all the big boys out there. Oftentimes you can look at companies that have been around twice as long as Omega and some of them don't have as rich a history as Omega does no. and so many accomplishments under their wings in terms of innovation, in terms of horological innovation, in terms of uh, Olympic space. Uh, uh, First Herbie on a wristwatch. The, James, the Bond, list, yeah. James Bond, yeah. James Bond. So you can get to enjoy all this. So this is, uh, this is gonna be a Chelsea factory. I'm actually gonna get out there and uh, I want to see this pop up because it's, it's going to be a pretty immersive experience in the brand, its history. Uh, it's going to have all the key moments in Omega history. Uh, uh, it's going to be, you know, talking about the extensive uh, relationship with the Olympic Games, uh, the space race, uh, deep sea exploration. So pretty much everything that Omega had their hands in is going to be up there on display. They're even going to have one of the original split second chronograph used to time races at the Olympic Games in 1932. If you remember, there's a famous picture of a guy sitting behind this, like this box, and he has like a bunch of these split second chronographs that are just sitting in there. Uh, and they're going to show the Omega's new Chrono Chime Caliber, the most complex movement ever made by the brand. So lots of cool stuff to see. That's happening at the Chelsea factory in New York City, November 9th through the 19th. You want to go? Uh, yeah, hell yeah, I want to go. I think we should I think we should get Cam with us and uh, maybe do a little video on this because certainly, uh, oh wait, he just pulled up the there picture. That's the guy I was telling you about. Oh wow. And there's the Chrono Chime as well. And of course, there's my guy, James Bond. Which, who's your favorite James Bond? I mean, I grew up watching Daniel Craig. I think it'll be interesting to see who supersedes him because I think he did a really, really good job as James Bond. I never watched, uh, I watched one of the Pierce Brosnan's and then the others I never watched. Okay, so, so I mean, obviously, every, every, nine out of 10 people say Sean Connery, but I'm a Pierce Brosnan guy. I think he was the perfect James Bond. There's, and I'm not to, not to downplay Daniel Craig as an actor or as, a, or as James Bond. It's just, I grew up on Pierce Bronson. And I think this is going to do it for today's episode. I mean, uh, seemed to be the theme, seemed to be uh, Omega. But, uh, all Omega. All Omega, more yeah. or less. Uh, or at least the bulk of the episode. But this is what we're here to do. <laughs> but this is what we're here to do. We're here to bring you the latest news. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll see you next week. Thank you.